Today we'll be discussing social stratification in the United States. So when we talk about social stratification, it's essentially the division of society into groups arranged in a social hierarchy. And it's present in all societies. We may group individuals based on gender, race, class or social class, their age or any other characteristic that a society deems important or favorable. What we want to understand about social stratification and this social hierarchy is that it's largely contingent on whatever criteria that particular society, that particular group views as valuable. And I just stated that, but I want you to think about that. What do people view as valuable? Think about within your own groups. You may be more educated than a close friend. You may have a nicer house than a close friend. You may have a nicer car than a close friend. But within your group of friends, none of that is important. The only thing that may be important to them may be, how many Pokemon do you have in Pokemon Go? How good are you at Super Smash Brothers? What type of pop figurines do you collect? So we want to understand that, that the criteria as to what is important, the criteria as to how we socially rank individuals within our groups or within our society is contingent on whatever that group or that society finds is valuable. What we want to understand is that within a society, within a group, we have individuals who occupy the higher social strata, and we have individuals that occupy the lower social strata. Once again, it's contingent on what is deemed to be admirable, what is deemed to be important. What we want to understand is that groups with the highest social strata, individuals that occupy the highest social strata, while well, those individuals can enjoy access to rewards and resources within a particular group, within a particular society, that members of the low, lower social strata will not have access to. So think about the privileges associated with occupying the highest social strata. Right? Think about those privileges associated with being in many ways placed on a pedestal. Now, what we also want to understand about social stratification is this concept of social inequality. And we've discussed social inequality before briefly when we talked about conflict theory as it relates to Karl Marx. If you recall, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, the have versus the have-nots. And when we use the term social inequality, we're referring to the unequal distribution of wealth, of power, or prestige among members of society. The idea that certain individuals within our society may have access to opportunities or to resources that are not equally distributed within our society. What we want to understand is that when we look at this social stratification, when we look at this social ranking within our groups, within our societies, these are characteristics of societies generation after generation after generation. And this idea that the social stratification can persist over multiple generations. As I stated before, particular societies, particular groups have the ability to determine what type of criteria is deemed valuable, is deemed important when it comes to ranking members of that group, ranking members of that society. And what we find 
is the social ranking, the social stratification is maintained when members of a society, when members of a group buy into it. They buy into the belief that there should be some form of social ranking. Now, what we want to keep in mind is that when we talk about social stratification, what we also see this ranking built on at times is pulling oneself up by their own bootstraps. And what does that mean? Well, when we use the term or we use this concept or we adopt this concept of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps means a degree of independence, that you did it on your own, that you made a name for yourself. And we argue at times within our society that that is valued. When in reality, when you look at many of the individuals who occupy the highest level, the highest strata within our society, they oftentimes had opportunities that may not have been afforded to the masses. And so let me give you an example of that. Think about Bill Gates, brilliant individual, founder of Microsoft. Would Bill Gates have been the Bill Gates he is today had he not come from a family with high socioeconomic means? Think about how many young individuals who grew up in poverty, who did not have the same privileges or opportunities as Bill Gates. Think about how many of those individuals were deprived of the ability or the opportunity to do something similar. What if Bill Gates didn't have access to computers at a young age? And he didn't have the resources to go chase his dreams? This is where this concept of pulling oneself up by your own bootstraps is challenged. The idea that in reality, no one does it alone or very few people do it alone. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, let's look at systems of stratification that exist within our society. And systems of stratification that exist within our society may reflect slavery, may reflect apartheid, may reflect caste systems. And so the first one we're going to tackle is slavery. And slavery is the most extreme system of social stratification that has ever existed. It relegates people to the status of property. And when we talk about slavery, what we need to understand is that by relegating people to the status of property, it's mainly for the purpose of providing labor for the slave owner. That individuals are bought and sold like any other commodity. That slaves not only lack freedom, but they're also not compensated for their labor. They experience mental and physical threats and abuse. On the social hierarchy, slaves occupy the lowest levels. They're deprived of rights that are entitled to other members of the same society. And what might qualify an individual for slavery depends on that society. In the United States, we know that slavery was associated with skin color. In other areas, slavery may automatically be associated with skin color, with being born into poverty, or whatever that society deems as a qualifying factor. Now remember, when it comes to slavery, individuals don't willingly 
enter that system. They're typically coerced or forced into a system of slavery. And what we want to understand is that slavery has existed throughout history. It's existed in the United States. It's existed in South America. It's existed in Europe. It's existed in the Bible. And so you want to take that into consideration. What we want to understand is that slavery, historically, has served as a profitable economic system. That is for the slave owner. Slaves were very rarely granted their freedom. They were forced to work in agriculture, in construction, in mining, and provide domestic service. And what we find is that in today's world, slavery is prohibited by nearly every nation through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The idea that slavery is illegal, that slavery is immoral, but let's not be foolish in thinking it doesn't exist because it does today. In India, in South Asia, West Africa, and other countries, we still see forms of slavery taking place. We see child soldiers. We see serfdom. We see forced and bonded laborers. We see human trafficking, not only abroad, but also in the United States. We see sex slavery, not only abroad, but also in the United States. And so we want to keep that in mind. That although the Universal Declaration of Human Rights deems slavery illegal and immoral, there are forms of slavery that still exist today. Let's look at some historical photos of slavery in the United States. We look here and we look at individuals being bought and sold. The slave trade that plagued a significant percentage of America's history. Photos from plantations. Think about this. When we talk about slavery in the United States, we're talking about 200 plus years. We're talking about generation after generation after generation of Africans, now African Americans, being relegated to the lowest level on the social strata, being relegated to the status of property, individuals being bought and sold, families being torn apart due to the slave trade. We're talking about individuals being beaten, threatened, and killed for knowing how to read, for knowing how to write, because they were viewed as a threat. Let's look here. Some other examples of the brutality of slavery. An individual whose back is scarred by multiple, multiple whippings. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see a poster used to advertise slaves who are available for purchase. You see further examples of rewards that were given for the capture of escaped slaves. And I want to show you this map here. This is a map of 1860. And you're able to see slave states and free states. Those states in yellow were free. Those states in orange were slave. And let's look at this. South Carolina's population was 57% slave. Mississippi's population was 55% slave. And every semester I have students saying, 
well, if slaves made up a majority of the population, why didn't they overthrow the plantations? Why didn't they take over that state? Well, it wasn't as simple as that. So think about it. You're a slave in South Carolina. For generations and generations, your family has been a slave at a particular plantation in South Carolina. All you know is that plantation. You know nothing of the outside world. You can't read, you can't write. You have very few individuals within the state of South Carolina or surrounding states who are for the abolition of slavery. So if you overthrew your plantation, let's say you overthrew plantation by plantation by plantation, well, where would you go? Because if you go, to, go south, you're hitting Georgia and Florida, slave-holding states. If you go north, well, you got to go through North Carolina, Virginia, or go through Tennessee and Kentucky before you even hit the free states. It's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and say, well, if I was a slave back in 1860, I would have done A, B, and C. But you're looking at it from a 20th or 21st century perspective. Place yourselves in the shoes of a majority of slaves. Freedom was not an option, unfortunately. And so you want to keep that in mind. Let's look at another form of stratification or another system of stratification, a caste system. A caste system is a form of social stratification in which your status is determined by your family's history and background and cannot change. Based on your heredity, whole groups of people are born into a certain strata. These castes can be divided along religious, economic, or political lines. They can be contingent on a person's skin color or other physical characteristics. What we find in this highly stratified society is that individuals have little or no chance of ever changing their position on this hierarchy, no matter what that individual achieves. Indiv on an in I'm sorry, no matter what that person achieves individually. What we know about caste systems is that Individuals typically marry within their own group. Their caste ranking is passed from one generation to the next. High-ranking members of a caste tend to be prosperous. right? They tend to reap all the benefits of society, while members occupying the lowest-ranking stratus or the lowest-ranking caste, well, they have less access to resources. They're more likely to live in poverty and they're more likely to suffer from discrimination. And this is an example of a caste system. The type of rankings that were developed in societies that, that adopted this type of system. Now let's look at apartheid. And apartheid is a system of segregation based on racial and ethnic groups that was legal in South Africa between 1948 and 1991. When we think about apartheid, many of us may automatically think of Nelson Mandela and his struggle, his fight against apartheid. And so in South Africa during apartheid, people were broken into four main racial groups. The whites population, which was made up of individuals of English and Dutch heritage. Those individuals held all the power as far as political, social, and economic power go. Indian from India, 
colored individuals who are of mixed race and the black population, which actually made up about 60% of South Africa's population. These four groups were geographically segregated or separated. They were socially segregated or separated from one another. Interaction between the groups was highly discouraged. The black population was forcibly removed from about 80% of South Africa. The black population was relocated to these so-called independent homelands that we can relate to, um, to the United States in the form of Native American reservations. And the black population did not have the right or the opportunity to enter the rest of the country without a pass, without proper permissions. And so here are some images from apartheid. Signs similar to what we saw in the United States during the Jim Crow era, limiting access to certain um, properties, limiting access to certain resources, bathrooms, water fountains, whatever it may be, to individuals of white skin color. A young black South African male having his ID checked, having his property checked by a law enforcement officer. We know that law enforcement agencies in South Africa were used to promote and, and so-called protect these unjust laws. This is what a pass or a passport looked like for black South Africans who needed to travel across the country or to leave the reservations. And once again, violence was oftentimes used against the black South African population. Now let's look at this concept of meritocracy. And when we talk about meritocracy, we're talking about an ideal system that's based on the belief that social stratification is the result of personal efforts or merit, and that that determines social standing. So what does that mean? Based on what you accomplish in life, that will determine your social standing within society, that will determine your social standing within your group, that will provide you with access to resources and opportunities. What we want to understand is that according to meritocracy, high levels of effort will lead to a higher social position. But what we also want to understand about meritocracy is that as an ideal and not real, such a society has never existed where social rank was purely built on merit. As I stated before, it comes down to opportunities. It comes down to luck at times. It comes down to an axis of resources. The idea that Bill Gates would not be Bill Gates, as I stated before, if he did not come from a family with high socioeconomic means. And so you want to take that in consideration as we go through this. We want to look at social stratification systems that determine our social position under the guidelines of income, education, and occupation. See, as sociologists, we adopt the term status consistency to describe a consistency or lack thereof of an individual's rank across these factors. So you're thinking to yourself, well, what does status consistency actually mean? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. 
a person is considered to be status consistent if their educational experience falls in line or is consistent with their access to job opportunities, with their struggles to meet the daily demands of life. So if I was a high school graduate with no college experience, working a minimum wage job, struggling to afford my rent, relying on government subsidies, we can argue to a certain extent that there is a degree of status consistency because my, re my reality illustrates the daily struggle of the working poor. That we know in the United States, although it's not in 100% of cases, but in many cases, if an individual does not have a college degree or a trade, there is a strong possibility that that individual will struggle financially. That that individual may struggle to find a career as opposed to a job. So we can argue there's a degree of consistency there. Where we start to see status inconsistency is if an individual started off with only a high school diploma, they started off working a minimum wage job, they struggled for a handful of years, but then they were able to save up enough money to open up their own business. Their business is a success despite having limited income, despite having limited educational experiences. And in their first year, they make $125,000. Then we can say this is a degree of status inconsistency because their earning potential does not necessarily align with their limited education, with their background of struggling financially. So we just keep this in mind. Status consistency means that all factors line up. And you can argue that to a degree, they make sense. It was expected to have that struggle. Status inconsistency is when individuals break that cycle of struggle, break that cycle of poverty. And so let's look at social stratification and mobility in the United States. Think about the concept of the standard of living. The level of wealth available to a certain socioeconomic class that's necessary to acquire the material goods that are needed to survive and comforts to maintain a particular lifestyle. When we talk about standard of living, we're looking at income, we're looking at employment, we're looking at class, we're looking at poverty rates, we're looking at housing affordability. Think about housing affordability in the state of California. Housing is not affordable. Individuals can work two jobs. Both individuals, let's say a two-parent household or two-person household, can work two jobs and never be able to afford a house, at least in the urban areas of California, particularly Los Angeles. And think about how expensive that is to survive. Think about falling into the middle class at $70,000 but not being able to purchase a home in California at $70,000. Because the middle class in California is drastically different than the middle class in let's say Nevada. What we find, for example, is that in the state of Nevada, I lived in Vegas for some time when I worked at UNLV. In the state of Nevada, particularly in the city of Las Vegas, you can still buy a house for $120,000. 
you could buy a very large, very nice house for $300,000. Can you buy a large home? Can you even buy a home in California for $300,000? Maybe if you go to the Valley, maybe if you go to the Inland Empire, but around Los Angeles, that is very tough, even for a townhouse or a condo. It's very tough to find a place for 300000 The average cost for a home in Los Angeles today hovers around $700,000. Let's say you purchased a home for 700000 and the total price for the home was seven hundred and fifty. You put fifty thousand dollars down, and you had to finance through a mortgage seven hundred thousand dollars. Let's plug in your property taxes. Let's plug in your um, obviously your mortgage. Let's plug in your insurance into the mix. We're looking at a monthly payment above $4,000 a month. And we're just talking about housing now. Your monthly mortgage payment would be over $4,000 a month. Most individuals in the United States cannot afford that. And so we need to take into consideration the standard of living. That you may come from a family or you yourself may be making seventy dollars to $80,000 a year. You'd be living like a king or a queen in Vegas, living comfortably. You'd be living comfortably in, in Arizona, making seventy to eighty thousand. But in California, especially in Los Angeles, it's still a significant struggle. What we want to understand is that the standard of living and the quality of life may at times be in opposition to one another. Because the standard of living is basically, what does it take for me to survive here? And the quality of life means, well, I'm surviving, but am I really enjoying the work that I'm doing? Am I really enjoying the daily struggle to survive? Am I happy? Am I able to afford the things that I want, such as a home, a car, the ability to go on vacation. What we want to understand about the United States, as well as other countries, is that we do not have an even distribution of wealth. Most Americans believe that they're middle class at 70,000, that they're middle class, but realistically, to be middle class, you have to make $70,000 a year. A majority of Americans don't make $70,000 a year. So although people may assume that they are middle class because they have an LED TV, because they have a new car, because they have the latest iPhone, in reality, they are not middle class. They are working class or lower middle class. And so you want to keep that in mind, because if I was to do a survey, and I was just to walk around randomly and ask individuals, where do you fall without providing them a breakdown of the different um, levels of income? And I was to ask individuals, do you identify as higher class, upper middle class, middle class, lower middle class? A vast majority of individuals would most likely argue middle class. Since the 1970s, we've seen the middle class shrinking. The overall income, the wealth has been declining. And so you want to keep that in mind. Now, let's continue with this discussion of social mobility. When we use the term social mobility, it's the ability to change positions within a social stratification system where individuals have the ability to improve or diminish their economic status 
in a way that affects their social class. So we can either experience upward mobility, which essentially means an increase or upward lift in our social status. You earn a college degree, hopefully you get a higher paying job, hopefully you get a job promotion, right, as a result of earning that college degree. Maybe you don't have a college degree, maybe you learn to trade and you go through an apprenticeship program where maybe you start off at 14 to $16 an hour, fast forward a couple of years, now you're making $45 an hour. Or maybe you marry someone who has a good income. And all of a sudden you go from being a member of the working class, lower middle class, to being a member of the middle class or upper middle class. Then we look at downward mobility. And it's the complete opposite of upward mobility. It's a lowering of one's status. Maybe there were some business setbacks, unemployment, illness. Think about this whole experience with the coronavirus. You have individuals who identified as middle class, individuals who fell into the category of upper middle class, who have suddenly lost their jobs. You see companies downsizing. You see companies losing significant amounts of money, having to lay off workers, having to lay off not only frontline workers, but also management. And so individuals are losing their livelihood. So they're going backwards as far as mobility goes. It's a downward spiral for them. Let's look at social class. And when we use the term social class, we're talking about a system of stratification that's largely based on access to resources such as wealth, property, power, prestige. We look at social class primarily from the lens of capitalist societies. And when we use socioeconomic status, we are essentially referring to a measure of an individual's place within a social class system. We can use social class and socioeconomic status as interchangeable terms. What we want to understand about social class is that it's not as rigid as a caste system. Although we may inherit at times the social class of our parents, we also have the ability throughout the course of our lifetime to either move up or down that strata. So you may have grown up in a low-income household. You may have grown up in a poverty-stricken household. But that does not necessarily mean that you are married to that status. Let me give you an example of this. You may have grown up in a low-income or poverty-stricken household. But right now you're pursuing a degree in nursing. Nurses on average with overtime will make north of $100,000 a year. If you're making north of $100,000 a year, let's say at 21, 22, 23 years old, and that income only increases with every year that you're practicing nursing, well, guess what? You're no longer low income. You're no longer living in poverty. So you have that ability to rewrite that life script. What we want to also understand is that social class is not necessarily always based on race or ethnicity or gender or age. But what we want to take into consideration is that these categories can certainly affect a person's experience with social class, a person's position in the social stratification system. And, what we, and we refer to this as intersectionality. This idea that different categories of inequality, race and ethnicity, class, gender, etc., can intersect to shape the lives of individuals and groups. This idea that we are not just solely male or female. 
We are not just solely of a particular racial or ethnic group. We are not just solely of a particular gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation. That we are a mixture of all these factors. That we are middle class and male and Christian and Latino, Hispanic, and so on and so forth. And all of those categories that we occupy shape our life chances, shape our life experiences in some way. That our life experiences are inclusive of all these different categories, not exclusive of all these different categories. And so you want to keep that in mind. Because when we talk about intersectionality, we could talk about male privilege. We could talk about white privilege. We could talk about how in our society today, especially in certain regions of the United States, white Christians are viewed differently than ethnic and racial minority Christians. The idea that we live in a heteronormative society where heterosexuality is considered the norm, so there are certain rights and privileges afforded to heterosexual people, and certain rights and privileges are deprived to homosexual individuals. Now let's look at how our society is ranked based on social class. We have the upper class or the capitalist class at 1% of the population, which means that they have incomes, annual incomes, north of $2 million a year. We look at the upper middle class, and these percentages will fluctuate from year to year, but let's say 14%. And these individuals earn incomes between 150 to $2 million a year. We have the middle class, which is 30%. Once again, this number fluctuates. Individuals who are earning anywhere between 70,000 to 150,000 a year. The working class, another 30%. 40,000 to 70,000. Remember, as I stated before, although a majority of Americans may identify as the middle class in their own heads or under their own understanding of what middle class means, from a sociological standpoint, we argue that a majority of individuals are working class. We look at the working poor. That's 25000 to 40000 a year. And then the underclass. Those are essentially individuals that make less than $25,000 a year. And so we want to take this into consideration because when we look at the characteristics, now, the characteristics that I'm providing right here are generalizations. There are always exceptions to the rule. But when we look at the 1%, those are individuals that are largely self-sustaining. Those are individuals that are, are in the elite class. They have a total net worth that is greater than the entire other 99% of the population. You have old money money that is passed on from generation to generation, the Kennedys, the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies. You have new money based on individual achievements. Right? Those could be musicians. Those could be professional athletes, for example. Those can be um, tech entrepreneurs. These individuals at, my, at times may be highly educated, are highly influential, but remember, being highly educated is not necessarily a prerequisite to be a member of the upper class. These individuals may have access to elite prep schools, to prestigious universities. They have the resources to prepare them for the Harvards, the Yales, the Princeton, the Dartmouth, the Browns, the Columbias, the Cornells, the Stanfords. They have those resources. The upper middle class 
typically well-educated, not 100% of the time. They may have a, a skill that affords them this particular lifestyle. They may hold executive, managerial, or professional positions. There's a sense of financial stability. They're more likely to own their own home, have disposable income that allows them to travel, for example. We look at the middle class, comprised of white collar workers, lower level professional management workers, highly skilled laborers in technical jobs, right? These individuals may have a college degree, may not have a college degree. We start to see a decreasing level of home ownership within the middle class. This class, the middle class is shrinking due to an economic recession at times, a housing market crash, higher rates of unemployment, corporate downsizing, outsourcing of jobs to other countries, or the complete elimination of jobs. We look at the working class. Typically, a high school education uh, may be in a manual labor service industry job. It varies from individual to individual. Uh, these are individuals uh, who have a lower net worth overall, uh, who are more likely to live in rental housing, but that doesn't necessarily mean 100% of the time. Um, we probably know individuals, I know individuals who fall into this category, who not only own a home, but who also own several properties. They make smart money decisions. They can save, right? Very limited amounts, but they're able to make investments based on those amounts. We look at the working poor. Generally not well-educated. Um, typically do not have a high school diploma, lower levels of literacy, higher rates of underemployment and unemployment, right? They may rely on government social welfare subsidies in order to survive. And then we look at the underclass, the truly disadvantaged. Living in poverty conditions may rely on public benefits and charity to survive, have a chronic difficulty of having enough money to just cover the basic needs. Uh, may live in substandard housing, may be homeless. They are officially labeled impoverished by standards established by the federal government. And we'll look at those standards uh, a little later. We look at this concept of poverty, relative and absolute poverty in the United States. And relative poverty is essentially a comparative measure whereby people are considered impoverished if their standard of living is lower than that of other members of society. So let me give you an example of that. Relative poverty may be, man, I have the iPhone 8. I wish I had the iPhone 10 or whatever it may be. Man, that person's privileged. Man, that person's rich because they have the nicer iPhone. Man, I'm drinking this Costco brand water, and that individual's drinking Vaz. That person's living the life. Not realizing that you're fortunate enough to have a phone. You're fortunate enough to be drinking water, while other individuals don't have that good fortune. We look at absolute poverty as a measure by which people are unable to meet minimal needs for food, shelter, clothing, and healthcare. That there is this consistent level of poverty that exists. That individuals are struggling to survive. And so we wanna make that distinction. Relative poverty is looking at what other people have and saying, well, I must be poor because I don't have the latest phone. I must be poor because I'm not drinking that fancy bottle of water. Well, absolute poverty saying wish. Well, I wish I had water to drink. I wish I had food to eat. 
And so you want to keep that in mind as you make that comparison between relative and absolute poverty. What I want us to understand about our society is that when we look at low income and poverty, let's look at those rates. When we look at low income, for a family of one, we're looking at, in majority of the states, $19,000 or below qualifies as low income. Or really, $19,000 is, is the cutoff. But let's say an average family of four. In order to be considered low income, you have to be making $39,300 a year in order to be considered low income. Let's look at poverty. To be living in poverty for a family of four, you need to be making less than $26,000 a year. Well, we could argue that this is contingent. We have to take this in consideration on where you live. Because although these are federal guidelines, we could argue that you're living in poverty, essentially, in the state of California and the state of New York if you're earning $39,000 a year for a family of four, that you don't have to be making $26,000 to know that you're living in poverty in California. Because at $39,000 a year, can you survive in Nevada or Arizona for a family of four? Yes, it may be tough. And it is, I would actually argue, it is going to be tough, but you can still survive. In the state of California, that becomes incredibly difficult to do. So just keep that in mind. That those guidelines for what qualifies as low income, those guidelines for what qualifies as living in poverty, although they are federal guidelines, it's also relative to where you're living. What we want to understand is that roughly about 15% of the American population lives in poverty. And majority of the individuals who are living in poverty are not unemployed. A majority of the individuals living in poverty are considered the working poor. 80% of the working poor population holds a full-time minimum wage job, yet are still living under the poverty line. So this myth that you know, those who, living, who are living in poverty are lazy, they don't want to work, is absurd. A vast majority of people living in poverty are working one or two jobs, are doing their best to work the equivalent of full-time hours, oftentimes working more than full-time hours, but never being able to escape that cycle of poverty. What we want to understand is that minimum wage jobs have never been sufficient enough to help an individual rise above that poverty line. And as I mentioned before, the poverty line is uniformly applied. It has no regard for regional differences or the cost of living. I wanna paint this picture for you. The Powell Grant, P-E-L-L. -L. The Powell Grant's what you get when you fill out your FAFSA application if you qualify, if your family's income qualifies. Well, understand that it doesn't take into consideration where you live. So an individual living in Las Vegas has the same opportunity to earn the exact same amount of financial aid or greater amounts, actually I should argue, greater amounts of financial aid than someone living in Los Angeles. Because let's say the person in Las Vegas comes from a family that makes $50,000 a year. He or she may qualify for a particular amount of the Pell Grant. But a family, a, a student coming from a family, let's say that makes $75,000 a year in Los Angeles may not qualify for anything. Now people argue, well, the student making 75,000 comes from a family that is middle class, yes, but they live in Los Angeles. The cost of living in Los Angeles is a lot higher than the cost of living in Las Vegas. That's where 
federal poverty guidelines, federal low income line guidelines being applied uniformly is a great injustice to individuals living in more expensive areas. When we look at poverty, what we want to understand is that poverty is more prominent in certain groups. 27% of the African American population lives in poverty, just under 24% of the Latino Hispanic population lives in poverty, just under 11% of the Asian population lives in poverty, and just under 10% of the white population lives in poverty. In addition, let's look at the elderly population, the disabled population, the foreign born population, women, children, single parent households also face high levels or high rates of poverty. And poverty is highest in the southern states. Now let's look at the major theories within sociology as they relate to social stratification. According to the functionalist perspective, remember interrelated connected components of society that inter interact with one another for the smooth functioning of society. Right? This idea that A and B and C need to be functioning, functioning properly in order for society to function smoothly. Well, according to the Davis-Moore thesis, the more functional or more important of a social role, the greater the reward must be. And what we mean by this is essentially, according to the functionalist perspective, that certain tasks are more valuable than others. So we may reward individuals who are conducting important work with higher levels of income, prestige, and power. That these higher wages encourage people to work harder and to work, work longer hours. And that the degree of skill required for a job de determines the job's importance. The more skill required for a job, the fewer qualified people there will be to perform that job. And as a result, it, according to the Davis-Moore thesis, it justifies a higher wage. But then we go a step further with this. Who's more valuable in society? The individual who picks up garbage, trash cans on a weekly basis, or the individual who's a medical doctor? We have a tendency to say, well, the medical doctor is more important. But why? Does every single individual within our society need a medical doctor on a weekly basis. There are many individuals within our society who don't go see doctors, even when they're feeling ill. But think about it, all of our lives are affected by the individual who's picking up our trash on a weekly basis. Because if that person wasn't picking up the trash, think about how contaminated our neighborhoods would be. We'd see a lot more rats. We'd have these awful smells. Disease would exist if trash was just left for weeks on end. And so you want to keep that in mind. And I'm not trying to degrade you know, the medical profession in any way. That's not the point. The point is we could find value in a variety of occupations even if they don't require the highest levels of education. Let's look at conflict theory. The idea that society, or I'm sorry, the social stratification system benefits some, but not all society. It brings a, a certain awareness to the inequalities that exist. How does such a rich society have so many poor members? Karl Marx, as we discussed before, ties social stratification to a person's relationship with production. Remember the bourgeoisie, the capitalists versus the proletariat, the workers. The idea that the capitalists own the means of production. They own the products that are being produced. 
and they put a system in place that allows them to increase their wealth while decreasing the wealth of the workers. Class conflict is created as a result of the social stratification. We look at symbolic interactionism and how it begins to shape our everyday interactions with individuals. If you recall, the meaning behind our interactions, the meaning behind symbols, that's what we talk about when, we talk, when we're discussing symbolic interactionism. Think about how a person's social standing can affect their everyday interactions. Think about how people interact with others who typically share a similar social standing. We typically live, we typically work, we typically associate with individuals who are similar to ourselves. Although we may stray away from this at times, for the most part, we may hang out with individuals who share a similar income, who share a similar educational background or racial or ethnic background, who have similar taste in food, music, and clothing. Our ability to relate to individuals. Think about how a person's appearance may reflect their perceived social standing. how when income increases, individuals may have a tendency to buy name brand clothing, to buy certain brands, to dress nicer, whatever it may be. They may see an increase in income and move to a nicer neighborhood or drive a nicer car. And people automatically may assume that that indicates social status. But not necessarily. There may be individuals who may be occupying working class status, but may be driving cars that you would typically expect someone of a higher middle class status to drive. We're not here to criticize. We're here to understand that individuals' display of status may not be consistent with their actual social status. You may have an individual who is incredibly wealthy, but based on their appearance, based on where they live, based on their, the car they drive, you would have no clue that they were worth millions of dollars because they live a very humble lifestyle. And so you want to keep that in mind.